This is my favorite design pattern. My favorite design pattern, right? As I think everyone is, is the thing that well, used to be super hard until the pattern came along and it made it super easy. Okay. And the thing that used to be super hard for me, because I've been doing ML for a long time, was this idea of stateless serving pattern. Right? Thank you so much, everyone, for joining this month book club. We're very excited to have Lack with you here today uh, to talk about his book, Machine Learning Design Patterns. Thank you so much, for Lack, for joining us. Welcome, Sophia. It's it's great. It's great to be here. I you know just before we started this officially, we were talking about uh, how the book club was organized, and uh, that's the, an amazing idea. I think uh, bringing together this old, I you know, like almost like uh, an offline book club in conjunction with a book tour, right? Uh, this ability to have uh, like authors come in and and talk to book clubs. That's pretty cool. I hope it takes off. <laughs> I hope so too. Um, yeah, so this video will also be posted on YouTube. If you are seeing this video on YouTube, please join in our book club. The link will be in the description below. <laughs> we Our book club is on Discord, so it's completely asynchronous. Just feel free to chat with us online. We read one data science or machine learning book every month, so so yeah, so our September book is Machine Learning Design Patterns, authored by Lack and uh, Sarah and Michael. We talked to Michael last week, actually. It was an awesome conversation. Um, yeah, he was in Sydney. <laughs> yes, absolutely. I mean, I mean, when he wrote the book, he was in New York. And so we were all in reasonably you know, similar time zones. And then uh, he moved to Sydney. Nice. So, OK, I want to start with some like questions since this book is written by three authors how did you like come up with this question like how did you assign who is going to write which section how does how does that work ah okay yeah i mean great question right uh so it started with uh, an idea of how this would work and that was ba basically me because i had started to write a few blog posts and started to do a few conference talks on this idea of machine learning design patterns. And I saw that it really resonated with, with potential readers. And at that point, I said, okay, when we are talking about design patterns, here are the ones that I have seen. And uh, now I, I, put, I put together an outline, uh, right? And uh, then said, okay, uh, who would be good co-authors with me on this outline? And uh, it was pretty obvious that this book involved two things. One, the ability to talk uh, clearly to newcomers to machine learning, which is something that Sarah does extremely, extremely well. Uh, if, you've, if you've not seen her videos on from zero to ML, for example, on using ML APIs or on basically getting to the uh, fundamentals on uh, text processing, for example, you should, right? So she has a really good knack of, um, of being able to speak to the potential audience, and that's important. The second aspect of this that I thought was super uh, important was, uh, uh, was experience working with uh, enterprise, enterprises adopting machine learning. And that's something that Michael has been doing quite a bit as part of the uh, Advanced Solutions Lab at Google. So uh, it, was, it was clear to me that these are the two folks that I wanted to convince to join me in writing the book. And I reached out to them. And once we got on, we took my bare bones outline and then we basically brainstormed on how to uh, break it up and how to, how to organize the book and uh, now we started with some of the experimentation that I had done when I gave my uh, like when, when I did my uh, conference presentations and when I wrote my blog posts. Uh, you know, so and so based on that, we said, okay, every pattern has to have this structure, and then we kind of divided up in we reorganized the patterns. We added a few more that Michael and Sarah had also seen out in the wild, and with that, we came up with a list of thirty. And then that's when we started to basically decide how we were going to write. And the way we did this was that we took it chapter by chapter. And we started with chapter two because we said, like, chapter one is super hard. We'll come back and write chapter one. 
after everything is done. So we started with chapter, chapter I think like two or chapter three, like one of those uh, uh, pieces, and we discussed how each of the patterns would work, what their relationship was, et cetera, right? So we basically really uh, discussed and came to an alignment on what the thrust of that chapter is. And at that point, we basically divide up the patterns in that chapter equally among us. So if the if chapter three, I don't remember, had like six patterns, we each got uh, not two. If it had like four, maybe one of us got an extra one, right? So that was basically the idea. And then after we wrote it, we each reviewed each other's patterns and the review was pretty brutal. Uh, usually it would go from, you know, brutal in the sense of brutal in terms or to the text, not to the people. Right, uh, so it would basically go from something that was you now 15 pages down to something that was like five or six. So we were really, 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 uh, you know, uh, brutal on the text to make sure it was really crisp and it was clear because we, you know, 30 patterns and each of them takes like you know, for 20, 30 pages, it wasn't going to work. Right, so we basically looked at that and then we added a whole bunch of uh, like, you know, extra ideas that had been missed, et cetera. So we had like two rounds of revisions on the chapter. And at that point we were done. And then we move on to the next one. Nice, thank you. So basically you guys start with a chapter and all three of you write this chapter together. Correct. Correct. That's nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I've seen people try to break up a book by saying, like different people write different chapters. And then it's so obvious when you read the book, the voice of the chapters is different. The depth is different. Here, I mean, I would challenge anyone to go read the chapters and say, okay, who wrote it? I mean, maybe once in a while you would see some, you know, there'd be a paragraph that says, when we worked with X, okay, they say, okay, it was Michael who worked with X. So that must be, I mean, Michael wrote that, that, that thing, or if you see something about weather, it was probably me, right? But mostly you will not be able to tell who wrote uh, a pattern. So again, we divided by pattern by pattern. So there's a lead author on every pattern. Nice. So what is your favorite design pattern? <laughs> <laughs> what is my favorite design pattern? My favorite design pattern, right? As I think everyone is, is the thing that well, it used to be super hard until the pattern came along and it made it super easy. Okay? And the thing that used to be super hard for me, because I've been doing ML for a long time, was this idea of stateless serving pattern. Right? So it's, it's, uh, it's, it's along with the deployment. And it's the idea that you can capture all of the weights and parameters and pre-processing functions and everything in, uh, in a model export it and you do that in Keras, you say model.save and what you get is that proto buff and that proto buff is pretty magical because you can take that proto buff and give it to SageMaker and SageMaker knows exactly how to serve it or you can give it a vertex AI and it knows how to serve it. Now a lot of people of course like we now take this for granted that yeah we should be able to export a model and that model is stateless. In other words uh, you can have you know, hundreds of thousands of simultaneous requests to the model and it will still work. So in other words, it becomes a web service. Before this happened, right, this is how uh, like I was having to do this, was that I would basically train my model using neural network software. At the time, it was called SNNS, Stuttgart Neural Network, right? So it was basically this, uh, you know, uh, batch file, you train it, and it would basically give you a bunch of floating point numbers and so on. And then when I needed to serve it, I would basically write uh, you know, a, a C++ function that essentially had the same uh, number of layers and nodes and activation functions as this training model, making sure that everything was right, load the weights up, and then like remember somehow to do all of the pre-processing that I was doing uh, in, in and basically create a modular thing and I would give that library to people who ever needed to use it. And it was such a mess for maintenance because every time I upgraded my model, every time I created a new model, 
I needed to make sure that everybody who's invoking the model has this new version of the library. Right? Uh, so uh, in that sense, the amount of grief it saved me makes stateless serving pattern my favorite thing. Although at this point now, we all take it for granted because it's built into a lot of the frameworks. Right. It's really hard to imagine you have to translate all the models into C++. That's, that, that's yeah, I mean, a pain. Actually, again, like, you know, even though we say that the frameworks all support it, I still do run into uh, you know, data science groups where their way of deployment is a library. And that's, that is fundamentally bad practice. They should be using a stateless serving pattern and they should be deploying as a web service. So, uh, you know, the, the idea and the, and the best practice thrust still remains. Right, so it's not the it's, the problem is not the fact that you have to rewrite the code because of course you know, maybe you you're serving in Python and the code exists, but this idea of of deploying as a library is flawed. Mm. That's interesting. So, what is the hardest design pattern to write? <laughs> what is the hardest design pattern to write? It's the one that I wish people would would really think like five times before writing it. And that is the feature store design pattern. Okay. Uh, most of the times that I see people using a feature store, they don't need a feature store. Okay. And at some point I wrote an article, you should basically, you know, you, you, you can do a search for it or I can send you a link that is about, do you really need a feature store? And uh, it turns out that you need a feature store only if uh, you need injection of features on the server side. And that is not very common. Most likely the client that is invoking the ML model already knows all of the features or has the raw data from which you can compute the features. This idea that you need to basically get computed features, for example, like the, uh, let's look at an example of a, of a real feature store. Right? Maybe you want as the input to your ML model the average number of people, or, or not the average, the total number of folks who have bought this item yesterday, right? So you wanna basically get the recent popularity of the item. Now the person basically now visiting your website obviously doesn't know how many people have bought this item yesterday. That is a server side feature, it needs to get injected. And in order to inject it, you need to have a feature store where you have a you have a pipeline computing this feature store and putting it into the feature store so that the ML model can pick it up whenever it needs. That's essentially the role of a feature store, a computed feature that is injected server side. But unfortunately, the name seems to imply that you know, every feature goes into a feature store, and we I starts I see relatively simple ML models that should be completely stateless and that should be completely simple instead complicating themselves and putting you know, contorting into a feature store, which they don't need. Why do, why do you think that's the case? Why do people really into feature store this concept when they don't need it? Okay. There, I think there's two reasons. Uh, one is that their company has gone out and bought a feature store, right? So they're using an AWS feature store, they're using Tekton.ai, they're using Vertex AI feature store. And it seems like, hey, I have it, I should be using it. If I'm not using it, it is not standardized, right? You basically have this whole idea that ML models need to be standardized for ML ops. So that's really not true, but there is this uh, uh, you know, myth that standardization like every, every model looks exactly the same way and has exactly the same steps and has exactly the same dependencies, it's gonna be easier to deploy. So I have a feature store and I have this one model that needs it. So my other 99 models, I'm gonna force them into using it, right? And it just complicates life. So that is one reason, it's because you already have it. The second reason is something I think I fall into as well. I learned about a neat idea and I want to try it out. So I put it into a prototype and the prototype becomes a production thing. And all of a sudden there it is, the stuff that I was basically 
learning without quite understanding when I should use it, when I shouldn't use it, has moved from being a simple prototype into being the thing of production. That's, I feel like that's a lot of times what people do. They see this cool thing and they want to learn it and they want to implement it, exactly. which is like. Which is okay. Like learn, yeah. learning it is okay. Uh, implementing it, I mean, I, you know, I, I don't follow it as I wish I did. But this idea is like whatever you learn with, you throw away and you redo it. Like no, it, it when you you don't want to put stuff in production that you don't truly understand. Mm. Yeah, that's that's definitely a valuable lesson. <laughs> um, okay, another question. Mm -hmm. So since the book has been out for a year or so, um, are there new design patterns you wish you would include? Not really, not really. I mean, you can like I used I thought like, no, we need to keep this open. And uh, so we have our GitHub repository and on from our other books as things come along. I know as I write blog posts, I link into them for the ML ones. I haven't. Surprisingly enough, this thing has remained relatively stable, right, in terms of uh, the, the general ideas and what's needed, which is good, right? You don't you don't want, I mean, ML is moving fast enough. You don't want the best way to use ML to keep also changing as much. The engineering of machine learning is has been relatively, relatively consistently stable. Right, I like the design patterns are sort of the fundamentals of the system, not like, although you guys are using uh, the Google tech stack, uh, with all the code that could be changing over time, but I feel like the concept um, is is quite stable. Absolutely, absolutely. And again, I think when I read all the uh, and I read the Amazon reviews and etc., people are like, "This book has everything on the Google Tech Stack." Uh, it does, right? To some extent, we had to choose one tech stack to show an implementation, and the one that we were familiar with was the Google one. And so we chose it, but as you said, Sophia, the concepts are still valid. And uh, now we most of the implementations are in TensorFlow, so it would act it, it works exactly the same way if you're using uh, SageMaker, if you're using Azure. Uh, I hope you're not rolling out your own TensorFlow serving, etc. So given that you're probably going to be using a cloud and you're going to be using an open source system, the concepts and the way that you use them are know are still valid uh, but we did not want to pollute the book by saying all right here's the here's the three-liner code in google here's the equivalent three-liner code in 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 SageMaker. it's pretty obvious and there's and what we wanted to focus on was the pattern right i find it easier sometimes easier to understand when you have the concept and then you have the implementation even though I don't use Keras, I use PyTorch. Um, yeah. And I use I, I don't really use Google tech stack, but still like to see how that's implemented is kind of helpful for me to have understanding of the concept. Exactly, exactly. The whole idea about the implementation was not to say this is how, how you should do it, but to give you that additional understanding of this thing is concrete, it's real. And when we talk about this very abstract concept, this is how it shows up in a, in a in the framework that in a framework that a lot of people use. And then, like as you said, even though you you're no you don't use Keras, you use PyTorch, you you can kind of see the equivalent because you now uh, all of these things uh, are available in all of the frameworks. Yes. Um, I see on your background you have all your three books. I was so amazed you have written three books. <laughs> Actually, more, more, more. Oh, it's really? Like, uh, yeah, this is my daughter, right? So she's like, well, your, your, your wall is too empty. And then what O'Reilly does is that every time you write a book, they send you a cover and it was like stuck somewhere. And so it got hung. So at this, I think, point it's uh, three, five, six, six books. Oh my gosh, congrats. How did you, you do that? It's it's so impressive. <laughs> uh, it, actually, it was, I mean, uh, I all all kudos to Google, I guess, when I was when I was at Google was uh, uh, you had this uh, you know ability to basically because I was talking to a lot of Google Cloud customers and et cetera, it was an external facing role. 
uh, I was able to take many of the things that I was I was working on and developing and basically put them in in the in the form of a book. So uh, in in some ways it it worked out well because of my role, right? Uh, uh, so all six books were written in six years. So it was the six years of that I was at Google that I wrote the books. I don't know if uh, uh, that capability would exist like when I existed when I was a practicing data scientist at a, at a company, right? Uh, the the problems that I was solving were not large enough and interesting enough to go write a book on. Uh, they were they were much more narrow and much more targeted. And now I work much more in company strategy, et cetera, uh, on on data and AI, and that too is very company specific and context specific. So I guess what I'm trying to say is that uh, it, in a lot of ways, it is it is luck in being in, in a role where you basically uh, get to work on things that are of wide interest to a lot of people. Yeah, definitely. I find your book really helpful and I can't wait to read the other ones. I do use BigQuery, so the oh. BigQuery book would be helpful for me. <laughs> neat, neat. Um, so speaking of Google, you have been working at Google for many, many years and you were the director and global head of data and AI. Mm -hmm. Like, could you tell us what do you do? Like you're the executive. Oh, I'm no you... longer at Google. I've, I've, uh, I was uh, at Google. Yeah, was. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. So, um, so is the question, what did I do at Google or what do I do now? Uh, okay, let's let's do that two questions. One okay. is Google specific, um, your experience, your experience of hiring. I know a lot of people who are watching this video would be interested in working at Google or working in the data AI field. Like what, sure. what, what are you looking for for new talents and uh, that, that sort of thing? <laughs> okay, so when I, I, I was at Google for six years and I had essentially two jobs at Google. The, uh, I joined Google uh, in 2014, 2015, I guess, uh, when uh, it was just about getting serious in Google Cloud. So anybody like wanting to join Google, that's my first piece of advice. Uh, figure out what parts of Google, Google is investing in, right? Google's a really, really, really big company. And you want to know the areas in which Google is basically saying, okay, this is this is the stuff that we're going to basically develop and invest in and build new. And there's going to be a lot of opportunities in that division of Google. In my case, it was Google Cloud, like you know, six years ago and seven years ago, when uh, that was something that they were getting serious about. And uh, uh, at the time, Google Cloud had three products. Uh, it had App Engine, it had BigQuery, and it had like storage and you know, the basic stuff. Uh, so this whole idea of like how do we basically how do we get engineers and developers to adopt Google Cloud was a burning question. And uh, so 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 my my first job was to basically help customers adopt Google Cloud by helping build a professional services team, and in the process. We had to teach all of the, all the PSO folks how to how to build data engineering systems, and the stuff that we did to teach our internal folks was what we externalized as courses as well. So then, like you know, we ended up getting a partnership with Coursera to put our courses there. We had we built out an uh, an instructional uh, train like team got a bunch of companies willing to teach Google Cloud. So a bit of the business part of, of teaching, but it was a professional services and learning and enablement. That was my first job, all focused on how to basically teach the larger audience how to use Google Cloud and you how to use the products in Google Cloud, especially as the number of products started, went from that three to a, to a larger number and to be a, be a more complete platform. And then like three years after that, like it was uh, uh, one of the things that we kind of realized was that there's only so much that Google as a professional services company could do. Like at the end of the day, what we started to see was 
a lot of our customers were solving very similar problems over and over again. Like they were building a marketing analytics platform or they were trying to, they were trying to detect anomalies. So my second job at Google was the solutions team where we built canonical reference solutions to a wide variety of data and AI problems. And uh, so in both of those roles, uh, I ended up like basically helping build teams, right? So on, on the professional services side, uh, you know, the Google is uh, Google Cloud is a product company. It doesn't have that many people uh, in the PSO, but there are folks in professional services. So one of the roles, if you're interested in working at Google and you're a data and AI person, is to look at the professional services team because what they do is that they end up solving hard and challenging problems at a wide variety of customers. That's what Michael Munn does, for example, right? So he runs the advanced solutions lab where this is the hardest of the hard problems. And uh, you basically have, have a business that basically sends their data science team to Google for a period of three to six months. And, and Michael and team work in collaboration with them to go basically build the answer to that hard problem. Right, so uh, that is an that is an option. Right, so basically working in the professional services uh, team at Google to basically help uh, build for customers, but that's for a single customer. The solutions team, the second team that I have built, is more much more general. It's this idea of basically finding common problems and building reference solutions. And so whenever you look at Google Cloud Next, a lot of the speakers will be from the solutions team because it's basically these, how do you put these cloud products together to solve a specific problem, right? So those are the two teams that I was involved with and we're both uh, always actively hiring. And I'm, I'm sure pretty uh, would be interested in hearing from, 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 from anybody on, on this chat. Okay, so it's like you guys create templates for people to use. Uh, templates in the sense of like everything from system to uh, to code, uh, you know, the, like you no know, Terraform templates with with the uh, you no know, with the model with the Keras model code with all of the data engineering with the pipelines to pull the data in. If the, if a lot of times this data comes from Salesforce. There will be a Salesforce connector to, to pull that appropriate data, transform it, you know, join it against some other data. So again, the common things that have to be done to solve that specific problem, we end up building it so that it doesn't have to be built by each one of our customers. That sounds amazing. That sounds like something I could use. I use Salesforce. Yeah, absolutely. Cloud.google.com slash solutions. Go take a look. There's a there's a huge variety of uh, things there. There's a library of stuff that 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 may be useful to you, Sophia. <laughs> Thank you. Um, another question, as an executive at, at Google, how did you manage your team and hire? Uh, how did I manage? Well, I mean, the teams were relatively small. Um, uh, they ranged from like, you know, depending on how you looked at it, like a team of like seven or eight to overall influence over teams of about 100 to 200 people, okay? And uh, mostly it's about basically uh, providing people uh, with direction and vision and allowing them to go, uh, you know, enabling them to basically go solve things themselves. I, I don't really feel that I was managing that much at Google, to be honest. <laughs> but you had to set the vision. How okay. how do you come up with the vision? I feel like that's the hard part about being an executive, right? You have to see something that other people don't see and make a plan for your team and all that. <laughs> oh, absolutely. And again, uh, it it comes almost as part of the territory because you are you are in a bunch of reviews of a number of what's happening at a number of different customers and uh, 
like you know you're basically they're coming they're they're saying like there's like a quarterly review with the customer they come and say this is basically what we're doing this is what the challenges we are this is the stuff that we try to do on google cloud and we couldn't do it this is what was hard so you hear that from a, no, a number of different customers you hear from professional services they go they they'll come and say well here's a project that i was on and this part was easy this part wasn't hard this is why it was delayed so lots of times the fact that now again people hate meetings but when you go into a meeting what you're basically as an executive what you're doing is that you are recognizing patterns you're basically saying i heard this here from this side of the business i'm hearing it here from this other side of the business and these two things are related because this is a, this is something that could be solved by having this additional thing in the product or this could be solved by changing the incentive of the reseller that's basically positioning this product. So basically having a holistic view of the business is really important. It's no longer just about engineering anymore. It's about the go-to-market. It's about the incentives that everybody from the seller to the partner to the, uh, to the uh, person doing the implementation to the customer and uh, like what they have promised their board they're gonna do and understanding that and doing and that pattern recognition is basically what an executive brings. And once you're doing, once you're in those meetings and you're approaching them as a pattern recognition exercise, the vision part essentially then becomes just prioritization. You know the 15 things that you know, if we had time, we would love to be able to do. And you're basically saying, here's the and then you're basically uh, in conjunction with the other executives, you're trying to decide. What are the three things that you have a you have a reasonable shot of fixing uh, in the next quarter? I love it. Thank you. That explains a lot. Like you get insights from customers from all the meetings you attend, and then you prioritize different different people's uh, ask or requirements. Right, and again, it's not just about their ask. If you ask, you know, if you ask ask. The, Henry Ford said, if you, if you ask somebody like, you know, who, who, like, you know, in the 1910s, what, what do you want? They would ask for a faster buggy, faster horse, right? You've got to basically uh, translate uh, the thing that they ask for into the thing that they want. They want speed. They want to be able to move faster and then say, okay, how do we provide that in the context of our environment? What, what happens when like people don't know what they want? <laughs> and then how do you give the... Uh, they they do they always okay. do i mean there's this thing that people don't know what they want is an engineering myth it's a myth that engineers basically place among on customers because customers aren't speaking the language that engineers understand customers know what they want but you have to ask like there's you have to ask why right they may say they want a faster horse but you have to ask, why do you want a faster horse? And then they will tell you that they want a faster horse because they want to get from A to B under three hours because if this food spoils, the food spoils if, it, if, it, if it's on their buggy for more than three hours. Now you know what they want. They want to be able to transport something from A to B in under three hours and you have a problem that you can go and solve, right? But even someone says that my customer doesn't know what they want, it's usually because they haven't asked the question deeply enough. They haven't, they haven't, I mean, usually it comes down to lack of respect for the customer, frankly. Lack of what? Lack of respect. Really? That, yes. that happens? Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> this is, yeah, I mean, and it, it's something that a lot of technical folks have this habit of falling into, where we, we are so engrossed in the technical language that we take what the, the, the customer is trying to meet us where we are, right? And they're saying, you know what I really want is this button that will do X. And then we say, ha, 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 what the, what the customer wants is one more button, ha, ha, ha. That's not what they want. They want a button to do X. And we need to, we need to stop and listen to that to do X and explore why that X is important to them. And it is not the button that they want, right? They want the capability, and then we figure out how best to deliver that capability to them. Right. Yes. I feel like, from my experience, everyone is respective of the customers. 
Yeah, and I agree with your point. Dig deeper into the question to see what exactly the customer wants. Yeah, yeah. a button might not be the best solution. Maybe they're not looking for a button. They're not looking for a button. Yeah, <laughs> yeah the, the reason they're saying a button is because they're trying to quote unquote be technical to tell mm -hmm. you like the, you know, this is how, you know, one way you could do this, of course. Like they're, that's not their role, right? But they but they know what they want. And uh, you know, at any time you're, you are tempted to say the customer doesn't know what they want. Uh, I I would prompt you to like stop, right? It's 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 highly unlikely that somebody with their career on the line, with their money on the line, with their with you know all of the things that they want to do, uh, you know, on the line, doesn't know what they want. They do. They just don't. They just they're just not speaking the same language as you are. Yeah, I guess that's the hard part. Sometimes customers speak business language. You have your tech people don't understand each other, basically. Exactly. How do you translate the business problems into tech problems, translate your tech abilities, capacities into business use cases? Um, yeah, I, I see that's the challenge over there. Okay, I guess we are almost out of time, but right. I do want to talk about your current role. You're an investor now, right? Which is right. super exciting. Right. Silver yeah. Lake, how did you uh, um, transition? So, so I'm, I'm, <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I work in a firm called Silver Lake Partners. And what we are is that we buy and sell companies. And in you know, we, we buy them, we hold them for three to five years, and then we sell them. And in between, we work with the management of those companies to help uh, improve the way that they work. And my role is to bring uh, data and AI enabled uh, workflows to the companies that we buy. So I work with the management of companies that we own to improve, in, so, so, so set in place uh, data and AI projects, help build uh, data engineering systems in order to basically derive business benefit from it. This is super exciting. Like, I feel like you're at the the top of the, the ladder now, be doing investment and buying companies. Like, uh, how did you make the transition? It's, it's how did I make the transition? Yeah. With a lot of fear and trembling, <laughs> because this is, this is totally not something that I know, right? But uh, I think that's something that, uh, you no, know, every, every, two or three years, you've got to look at your career and the projects that you're doing and the work that you're doing and say, uh, what is it that I know well? What is it that I don't know? And how is it that I can take the stuff that I know and use it to basically learn something new? Uh, because otherwise you become ossified. In, in a role, you become typecast and you become this person who does X. And I know uh, that is good early in your career. Early in your career, you want to build depth, right? So, but uh, once you're past your mid-career standpoint, you want to build breadth. So moving from depth to breadth is important. And uh, it is, it's scary. It's scary. It, 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 I, I'm still, no, every, every one of these transitions I've made has been super scary. Uh, and I'm still in the scared part of my new role. So wish me luck. Yeah, of course. Good luck. Oh my God. I feel like such inspiration for all of, all of us. We're just like so used to being in our comfort zone. It's really hard to like go into a brand new place where you are not familiar with. And you're doing it all the time, which is like super inspiring. Um, are you learning a lot of investment knowledge <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm learning a lot about how to look at a company and its business from a very holistic standpoint mm. and then how to basically uh and then like where what i bring in is how to how to use data driven insights to to fundamentally improve uh the way those decisions are getting made do you enjoy your work uh yes yes <laughs> it is as i said right it's uh it, it it is really really new and scary at this at this point 
but uh, like every time you basically work with the with the with the CEO and the CTO of a company, and they say, "Look, here's here's how you're doing X today," and this is if we were to basically put in place this other set of data collection initiatives, or if we were to take the data that we we're getting, or if we were to go to our partners and ask them for this information. I believe you can basically improve the way you make these decisions. And when that pans out, and it has panned out a few times, it's like an amazing thrill because all of a sudden you're basically seeing you know, 20, 25% improvement uh, oh, wow. in, the, in, in, uh, you know, uh, in revenue and profits and margin and these you know, real, real world uh, you know, measures. And that's, that's amazing. Do you work directly with their ML data science team? In, at some portfolio companies, yes, uh, not all. Uh, so it, it depends, right? It depends on uh, uh, you know, uh, the size of the company, the maturity, et cetera. But in, in some cases, yes, I do work with the, work with the ML team. In other cases, the ML teams, now, especially a more mature company, they're they have they're they're distributed across the across the organization, and at that point, I'm not really working with any one of them. I'm working much more around a new project that we might want to do. Right. I just feel like it could be difficult, like when you have this amazing idea and tell the company, and then like it's one thing to have an idea, another thing to implement it, and now you're not really in charge of those data scientists to implement everything, right? No, it, yeah, and, and usually yes. So again, it, it's about it's about uh, helping the management of the company realize mm. realize the benefit of it, right? And again, yes, you are absolutely right. Uh, the implementation is by the by by the company, not 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 by me. Okay, so it's more like educate the leadership on data science AI, Some, something like that. Yeah. Okay, sounds good. Uh, <laughs> I think I have asked all our questions. Do you have any words for us? Uh, any advice? No, no, or... I mean, yeah, this was a great conversation. I know it's weird from machine learning design patterns and feature stores into, into a lot of like, you know, career and uh, all of that. So it's just fun. Thank you very much. Oh, um, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> okay, bye. Okay. Um, yeah, please keep in touch. and. Uh, let us know when your next book is. Where will be exciting to read it? <laughs> okay. Sounds good. Bye bye. Okay. See ya. Bye. <laughs>